begin transmission. One of my earlier transmissions, I, I talked a little bit about these, these really incredibly fascinating creatures with armor, plated bodies, and venomous stingers in their tails. They, uh, they aggregate together and form these complex societies where they, they differentiate label, la labor. They have um, specialized tasks that individuals will do. And it's one of the most complex societies on this planet. And they do all kinds of different things. There, there are thousands of species. There is, is one species that, uh, there are actually a few species that are farmers. They will take these little tiny insects called aphids and even build little fences around them. And they take care of them, uh, foster them, feed them, and then they feed off the sugary um, uh, exuded substance from the aphids. And so they have kind of a, a farmer relationship with them. Others farm fungus and feed the fungus uh, a little bit of some plant parts. And uh, so they're, they're really complex animals. There are others that uh, actually go out and invade other ant colonies and steal their uh, larvae. And they bring the larvae back to their colony and then raise them as uh, a working class. So most of these societies, they have a soldier cast in a working class. And in these raiding um, ants, they go out and um, steal the young from other ants and then raise them to be their slaves, essentially. Um, and what's remarkable is that, so you have a colony that has two different species, and one are the soldiers and one is the work, are, are the workers, and uh, they don't really switch roles very often. However, when the ratio of workers gets too great, they will flip the tables and the workers will revolt and subdue the soldiers and then the, uh, the workers are in charge. Usually this ends in the death of the colony, <clears throat> uh, but it's, it's really remarkable how you kind of have this little microcosm of a lot of human uh, cultural norms with, with uh, slavery and farming and uh, the rise and fall of empires, um, all within these, these really fascinating little creatures. So I'd encourage you to read and learn uh, more about these. I can only deliver a small fraction of what is interesting about them. And uh, one thing I want to point out, we, caught, we got this video, a really fascinating video of um, a chain, a thread of army ants. These are ants that um, kill other invertebrates. And you can see here, they form this, this living bridge composed entirely of army ants. There's nothing solid in there, it's just army ants. And they're migrating up to invade a wasp nest colony. And wasps are another um, social group of insects that have a pretty uh, substantial sting. And ants and wasps are often locked in perpetual combat. In this case, the army ant colony has invaded, subdued the wasps. And um, if, you, if you look at the... Um, the, the little white things being ferried down, those are the little wasp larvae that the, that the ants are carrying off as food. Uh, really very, very fascinating um, interactions. And so even wasps, which are widely regarded as some of the most uh, dangerous and formidable insects, um, don't really stand much of a chance against army ants. And uh, there, there's one more story I, I meant to include in the lecture, but I'm just watching and I forgot it. So I'll just tell you now. Um, one evening, late in the well, we we went on a on a night collecting trip. So um, Isabella took us on a little path that she was familiar with down in the forest, and it was dark. We had our, our lights on, and as she led us through, we heard this sound in the trees, like a little rushing wind or maybe a waterfall. And she and Isabella froze, and then she dropped to the ground. She didn't tell us to what to do, but uh, we followed her lead and we all dropped to the ground. And as soon as we hit the ground, this huge rush of um, something just swarmed past our heads. Uh, quite, uh, quite terrifying. And when, we, when, it, when it passed over us, we asked her what that was, and she said that this was a, a nocturnal species of wasp called, um, that she's calling night marauders. And these night marauders are very unusual wasps, I don't appreciate that she didn't uh, warn us about this, uh, but night marauder wasps are, um, they're nocturnal, which is very, very strange for wasps. Wasps are, are usually diurnal. And there'll be a picture of these on a slide talking about use social insects. And you'll notice that all of the adults are clustered on the wasp nest itself. And this is uh, thought to be an adaptation to avoid um, these army ants attacking them. 
So if in, under normal circumstances, the wasp um, colony will be working and feeding and foraging all throughout the day. So their defenses are somewhat lax, uh, leading them, leaving them vulnerable to um, uh, an impressive army ant army. But if all the adults are at home, then the ants can never get a foothold because the, because the wasp is stronger than an ant one-on-one. -on -one. So what these marauder ants do is they all cluster during the daytime in their nest. But this means that they don't get any food during the day. So they have to um, go feed at night. And what they do at night is actually pretty similar to the army ants. They all swarm out at once and whatever they find, they bring back, whether that's ants or wasps or caterpillars or beetles or even small vertebrates, they will descend on them and carry them away in pieces back to their nest. So these ants and these wasps, these complex societies are kind of intricately locked in battle, uh, combat for a long time, and you have really interesting adaptations on both sides that kind of win that war. Um, so uh, that's all I really have time for an introduction today, but I hope you enjoy this, this short lecture on, it's not very short, um, but this in information that I'm giving you about um, some of my favorite animals, the, the ants. Look at this insect. This is a very unusual looking animal. It's got wings, but it's got mandibles, it's got antenna, it's got six legs, so we know it's an insect, but it looks unlike any of the other insects we've we've really talked about. If you look at the, the four legs, they kind of look raptorial, like a, like a mantis, but its, its wings are membranous, kind of like a wasp, and yet its mouth parts are mandibulate. So what kind of insect is this? This is a, a mantis fly, and it's in a completely different order than anything we've talked about so far. And in fact, there are, there are, over, there are about 30 different orders of insects, and we only covered half a dozen or so. So we've only really sampled the diversity there is in the insect world. And insects are incredibly diverse, as you guys know, um, and so it'd be, a sh it'd be a shame to kind of move on away from insects before talking about some of the really fascinating stories that insects can tell us. So uh, today, we'll, I'll just be sharing a little bit about the discoveries we've made here and how fascinating these creatures are, uh, beginning with this, this mantis fly. So this, this very unusual insect is a parasitoid, and it's, it's chosen as its, as its host a predatory insect. So th these guys live, live life a little bit on the edge. They have to lay eggs in a predator, and uh, specifically a highly effective predator of insects, um, spiders. So mantis flies, there are some species that parasitize the egg sacs of spiders. And to do this, they, the, the female mantis fly has to find a spider and then lay an egg on the spider or near a spider without getting eaten by that um, spider that would find a mantis fly quite delicious. Once the egg hatches, the larva will usually hitch a ride on the spider's back. This is the little larva of the mantis fly right here, right on the pedestal of the spider, right at the place where it can't reach it with its little legs to scratch it off and it can't turn around and bite it. So uh, the spider is probably aware that there's something there and it just can't get it off. Once the spider lays an egg, the larva will hop out and burrow into the egg and then eat all the young of the spider um, alive while they're developing. Which is really sad when springtime comes and all the little spiderlings are supposed to be hatching and you have a little expectant, happy, excited little spider mom ready to welcome her new young into the world and out emerges a mantis fly. Um, quite horrific if you're a spider mom. Very strange, um, very interesting. So this is the, the mantis fly, um, and a, just a little interesting life story. Really what I want to talk about though is um, the social insects. So insects, when we, when we came to this planet, we were kind of looking potentially for some kind of intelligent life. And while we haven't found any um, individual creatures that are as intelligent as any members of the crew, there are some animals that are collectively quite um, elaborately intelligent and these are the, these are the social insects so um, as I said the insects individually aren't necessarily as intelligent as humans they, they aren't as intelligent as humans 
collectively, you have what's called emergent properties. And what emerges from a group of social insects is distinct behavior that the individuals don't have. They can make decisions, they can, they can choose, they can uh, breathe and um, air condition themselves as a, as a group. They can, uh, they can move and they can exploit new habitats and take down larger prey as a whole than they can as an individual. And so some of the, the remarkable adaptations to social insect life are um, just phenomenal. And that's what we're mainly going to be talking about today, particularly in the, in the ants. But there, there are lots of other ones that we can, we can discuss briefly as well. Uh, so first of all, there's a difference between um, subsocial and eusocial. Uh, eusocial, if you remember that, that uh, prefix there, eu means true. So there are truly social insects like wasps and bees and termites. Um, truly social insects are going to have a uh, usually specialized functions. So the, there's going to be some type of differentiation in roles. Um, you may be familiar with workers versus queens versus soldiers in, a, in an ant colony. And so the, each of the individuals may have a distinct role in the larger colony. And this, so this is truly social. You have caste differentiation, individual specialized roles. And you also have um, transgenerational um, persistence of the population. So the, the queen will lay eggs and then those will grow up and the queen will lay more eggs. And so most of the offspring are coming from one or a few dominant females and so you have uh, it's basically a giant family unit if we compare this with subsocial behavior subsocial animals like uh, like these curious little beetles here these are called um, horned beetles or talking uh, talking beetles uh, these talking beetles are subsocial they uh, gather together in large groups but they're multiple families that kind of share the same resource they exploit the uh, decaying log habitats in forest floors and are really an important um, uh, habitat creator because the tunnels they make and the, the decayed wood that they eat um, forms habitats for a huge diversity of other um, living things to live in as well. But um, they don't have caste differentiation. They have adults and they have uh, grubs, they have larvae, but they, they're not really specialized like the, the usual social insects. And they're somewhat... Um, ephemeral so they they get together in aggregations at times but these little bits can break off little family groups can wander off and make their own um, sub social gatherings so they're not all they're not as tightly knit and it's a more of a facultative um, sociality these talking beetles are called talking because they have these special stridulatory organs that they can vibrate against um, their exoskeletons that create so far we've documented 14 different unique acoustic sounds so they can they can talk to each other they can communicate and communication is a level uh, is a sign of, of intelligence they don't they probably aren't communicating abstract things they probably don't wonder about um, the outside world a whole lot or you know whether or not you know what happens after after death um, but they can talk about they can say things like I'm bigger than you give me your food or I I'm with this guy give me give me your food or this is my tunnel don't block my way or it's getting dark or this is a warm over here or maybe this is a good food source so they can communicate some basic survival needs to each other and if you pick one up they can communicate distress so they they scream really loudly with this um, little scraping stridulatory organ and it sounds like this high-pitched shrill me put me down so uh, pretty interesting little animals but you should know subsocial versus eusocial um, kind of ephemeral gatherings non-differentiated multiple families um, versus eusocial which are um, usually a single large family unit sharing genetic similarity and significant cat significant cast differentiation and specialized roles Another um, example of a subsocial insect are cockroaches. And cockroaches are um, known from Earth's history, and they, they were kind of widely regarded as um, dirty, disease-carrying, um, bad insects. And that's, uh, that's, that's a little unfair because cockroaches are actually quite clean. They, they spend a significant amount of time grooming themselves. And guess what? If you touch a cockroach, they, they scamper away and they clean all of the human smell off of them. Um, they do not like 
your smell. They do not like being touched by you, and they are cleaner than probably you are. Um, even still, they, um, they eat our food, and they eat our leftover bits of food, and they um, live in dark places, and they scatter in light, and so we kind of think of them as, as bad insects. Uh, well, these, uh, these bad insects are actually pretty complex behaviorally. They avoid areas of light and seek shelter in dark places, which is obvious. They also like to um, seek shelter in groups. So if they had a choice between a shelter with a cockroach and a shelter without a cockroach, they would choose the one with a cockroach. There's kind of safety in numbers. And what some researchers did um, a long time ago, on a um, thousand years ago, they took a bunch of cockroaches, put them in a, an arena, and then put these little shelters in, and then they just turned the lights off and watched what happens. They had little cameras tracking their, their movements, and what they found was that um, eventually all the cockroaches would aggregate together under one shelter. They wouldn't split their group into multiple um, uh, subgroups, they would all tend to aggregate together, they wouldn't leave anybody out, um, but they would kind of wander, uh, they, they noticed a difference in individual cockroach behavior. So if we take kind of the two main driving decisions um, of the cockroach, they're going to want a dark place over a light place, and they're going to want a place with cockroaches more than a place without cockroaches. But the individuals are going to uh, pursue those things differently. So in this arena, they would uh, release a bunch of cockroaches, and they noticed that some cockroaches would consistently spend more time exploring the arena. And so they would they they measured the um, the ratio of time it spent in an open area versus in a sheltered area or near a wall, and they found that certain cockroaches were what they called reckless or brave, and these brave cockroaches would wander open spaces. And these would be the ones that would um, initially find the shelter. And then you had um, other cockroaches that were timid, and they would um, stick close to the walls, they would scamper really quickly across open spaces as if they were scared of their own shadows, and eventually all the brave and the timid cockroaches would collect, aggregate under the same shelter. And so they, um, these personalities were consistent, and so what they did was they created um, colonies of reckless cockroaches and colonies of timid cockroaches and then um, gave them uh, this little arena with food and just to see what would happen. And it turns out that both colonies um, uh, died. They, they didn't thrive. Um, so you need a combination of reckless and timid individuals for the cockroach colony to survive. And why is this? Well, think about it. If um, there's a cost and benefit to being brave, right? If you're brave, you have a higher chance of getting eaten or getting stepped on or getting lost, but you also have a higher, uh, you have an increased likelihood of finding food and finding shelter. And so it's high risk, high reward. And so a colony of all reckless, brave cockroaches would eventually die because they're, they're going to, they're going to all get eaten. Um, even if they find a lot of food, they're all going to uh, get eaten eventually. In contrast, a colony of just timid cockroaches, nobody ever ventures out to explore. Everybody just sticks to what they know and they, they don't take any chances and then they die because they can't find food. So uh, the, the best kind of cockroach colony is one that has both brave and both timid members because you have to have both. And I think that's really beautiful. I think humans are like that too. We need, we need people who are explorers and we need people who are um, caution. We need both, you know, Isabella and Dave. It could be as collectively that makes a very, a very good crew. So we can learn a lot from insects. And here's just uh, the way insects give birth. I thought you might uh, appreciate this. Um, some, in some cockroach species, they incubate the eggs in a, a specialized uterus, and then they hatch all at once and burst forth from the female in this cascading waterfall of little baby cockroaches. There you go. Now ants um, or myrmidons. I I have been um, watching and studying these little creatures since we got here, and these have quickly become my favorite animal to to watch. I spend hours and hours just outside watching these creatures live and um, explore their environment, collect food, and interact with each other and other insects, and they're just phenomenal. Um, these particular ones right here, um, I'm going to tell you just four very brief ones, even though they're 
so many cool stories um, about ants. The first one here is the harvester ant. These are fairly good sized ants. You can see they're, they're nice chomping mandibles. These uh, like to live in sandy desert environments and they have an incredibly potent um, venom. One of, the, one of the most potent venoms drop for drop among all, um, among all insects. And these were some of the first ants I encountered and the first ants I, um, I studied. And there, um, I noticed there are two different, uh, different colonies that looked very similar. So the, the general morphology was the same, but their colors were a little bit different. We had a, a red group and a black group. And I noticed that whenever they interacted, they would kind of uh, touch each other with their antenna. And then if they were of a different colony, they would um, clasp mandibles and uh, wrestle in this, in this uh, and try to stab each other with their um, stingers. And so there's this conflict between the red ants and the black ants. So I thought it would be fun to take a little plastic um, um, ice cream bucket and um, uh, because there's still ice cream here. And as, as, as you know, ice cream of the future and uh, cut the the bottom out of it so you were left with just a, a cylindrical plastic um, wall and this made a little arena that I could then put over the entrance hole to the harvester ant colony and the the plastic was so is so slick that they can't climb up so I could watch what they do in this kind of safe arena natural arena and um, then I would collect a bunch of rival ants a uh, little invading force, and then I would dump it onto the into the arena and just and just see the epic battle that um, uh, that happened next. And it was it was phenomenal. So you had this this epic uh, war between the black ants and the red ants. And um, I noticed something really uh, fantastic about as soon as the invasion occurred. So it seems like the the red ants were prepared for these um, invaders, and right underneath the the entrance hole there is a chamber filled with um, essentially uh, uh, guards, reserve guards, and as soon as the invaders were sensed these guards rushed out um, to meet the um, invaders. Some of them uh, went back and took um, little bits of debris from around the hole and plugged up the entrance hole. So they're basically shutting themselves out to fight to death to prevent these black invaders from um, coming in and taking all their their larvae, really phenomenal example of self sacrifice. As I watched this battle um, of my own making unfold, um, I also noticed that some of these ants were wandering around the battlefield collecting the dead, and so there are these little dead collector ants that would that would wander around, collect all the dead ants from both sides, and bring them over and throw them in a big pile. So by the end of the battle, you had um, you had this big pile of dead ants. And then you had uh, the, the living ants wandering around collecting all the, the dismembered parts. And you would have some ants that were, had been chopped in half and just had, you know, chopped in half right about here. And so you just had this top half wander, wandering around, um, quite, uh, quite gruesome. Um, but uh, really fascinating creatures. <clears throat> and one thing I was, I was interested in after I got stung by some of these is why is their sting so significantly uh, powerful? What are they attacking that needs this type of venom? Now it turns out it's not something that they're eating, it's something that they're defending themselves from. Because one of the primary predators of these harvester ant colonies is this, the horned lizard. And this horned lizard um, is almost impervious to ant venom and it will sit on the ant colony and shoot out its sticky tongue and just gulp them up um, in, in droves by the dozens. And it has this special saliva that neutralizes ant poison, um, ant venom. So as it's swallowing, the ants are trying to bite and stab, um, and the, the horned lizard has a really thick gelatinous mucus in its stomach that prevents the, the stingers from embedding, and it also neutralizes any venom that does um, get out. And so you have what you have is this, um, this arms race between the horned lizard and the ants. The ants try to get more and more toxic venom, and the horned lizard um, getting more and more immune to it and more and more defense mechanisms against uh, the venom. And that's why they're so toxic when 
um, an external third party comes into this, this warfare. Here is a harvester ant being uh, taken down by a, a group of Argentine ants. And Argentine ants are um, really fantastic. Um, they're a lot smaller, and so one on one, the harvester ants will always win. Um, but Argentine ants are, so th this, this, uh, this ant species is from Earth's history, right? They're, they're Argentine ants. And so ants are a really phenomenal convergent evolution between Earth and this planet. Um, but in Earth's history, there were these phenomenal um, ants that invaded North America, probably through um, uh, either either boat or some some type of you know human goods being traded across uh, country borders. And when they got here, they formed these massive um, colonies that um, are taking over native ant colonies. And in their native habitats, Argentine ants are kind of held in check by two competing ant species. You have the bullet ants, which I'll talk about later. There's these giant, um, really strong, potent venom ants, and the army ants, which I showed you earlier with the with uh, attacking the wasps. And so both the bullet ants and the army ants have unique adaptations to kind of dominate the forest area where these ants live. And these Argentine ants are so much smaller than both of these species. So what is their superpower to kind of combat the bullet ant size and strength and the army ants just overwhelming numbers um, and size. Well, the Argentine ant um, has a superpower of being numerous. So they have uh, millions upon billions upon trillions of individuals in their colony. So most colonies, like I was saying with the harvester ants, they recognize the smell of a, of a rival colony, even if, it, if it's the same species, if it's a, if it's a different queen um, that uh, has given birth to all these these worker ants they're going to attack it argentine ants share the same um, uh, pheromone uh, chemical cues to, as other colonies and so they form what's called super colonies they don't the colonies themselves the individuals don't attack each other instead they form these massive massive miles long um, sometimes thousands of miles long um, colonies of the same essential um, ant so when they get to North America, where they don't have the bullet ants and the army ant species to keep them in check, they've just started taking over all the native species. But of course, native species are fighting back. And so for a long time, there, there is this epic war, uh, warfare between um, native ant species and Argentine ant species um, called the, the San Diego Massive um, Super Colony of Argentine ants, and they were fighting the native ants. <clears throat> and every year, we can, um, we can kind of track their border as it shifted, and every year you'd have about 30 million ants die along this, uh, during this war, and the borders would shift, the territory would change hands, and so right along um, you know, San Diego and Central Valley um, going north, there is this huge conflict between Argentine ants and uh, native ants. This, uh, because, of, because of humans um, taking these ants um, inadvertently all throughout the world, there is now a global Argentine, or there was, there was a global Argentine ant super colony where you have um, members from California and uh, the Mediterranean and Japan that are all from the same super colony. And so this is really one of the, um, besides humans, one of the only global um, species that kind of took over um, Earth. Another fascinating um, ant group are the um, uh, the paramedic ants or the matabele ants in um, in Africa, and they attack termite colonies. So they're highly aggressive, and they will um, go out and raid other um, termites for their larvae. You can see here, this particular soldier has a whole lot of termites in his mouth. So they're typically a lot larger than the termites, and they can their raids are pretty infect effective. But the termites um, are protected by their own soldiers, which are about the same size as these um, ants. And so during these epic conflicts, a lot of the ants will be injured, sometimes um, mortally. And what's remarkable is that during the battle, if an ant gets injured, other ants will recognize that it's injured. They release a certain wound pheromone that, uh, that tells other ants that I'm injured, I need help. 
and those ants will uh, take the wounded back to their nest. And when they take their uh, and when they take the wounded back to the nest, they coat them with antibiotic saliva and they kind of hold their little wounds in place to kind of fuse them. And when they do this, about 80% of the wounded ants um, survive, which is, which is an incredibly high um, percentage. And this is really the only example we know of, of a species caring for wounded um, by itself. A lot of animals will... Um, treat wounds on their own bodies, but to treat wounds on somebody else's bodies is a pretty phenomenal level of complexity. Even more complex is that they, they triage. So if an ant has five legs chopped off and is leaking from its abdomen, the paramedics don't take it back to the nest. Um, they leave it to die because there's no hope in saving it. But if you're missing one leg or you have just a few nicks and bruises, you know, you're scooped up, taken back, and taken care of. What's even more interesting is that it's not the paramedics who are triaging, it's the, the wounded ants themselves. So if a wounded, if a severely wounded ant um, is covered with um, a wound pheromone of a, of a not severely wounded ant, um, then the, the paramedics will come and try to take it back to the, the nest and fix it. But the severely wounded ant won't let it. Um, it's essentially saying, no, no, I'm too far gone. Go ahead, uh, leave, leave me behind. And will wave its arms and slash its mandibles and prevent other ants from helping it. So it's a, it's a self-triage where the wounded ants themselves somehow recognize um, that they're beyond saving and then disallow help. And, you know, it could be a pretty simple cascade in the nervous system, right? I'm, I'm uh, just a, th a different a threshold of hormones that activates these different responses. But even still, it's, a, it's an incredibly complex behavior for these little invertebrates. The last one um, I have time to talk about are the bullet ants. And these, as I mentioned, are neighbors to the Argentine ants in their native area. And bullet ants are called that because their, um, their venom, when you get stung by one, it feels like being shot. It's incredibly painful. And probably one of the most painful um, bites uh, or stings in the, in the animal kingdom. And I mentioned the harvester ant drop for drop is more venomous, but the bullet ant um, venom is, they will uh, inject you with a whole lot more. And so the bullet ant is actually more dangerous than the harvester ant. And they're a lot bigger than the Argentine ant. Uh, remarkably, some um, uh, indigenous tribes for their coming of age ritual for young men, they would have to, they would weave a cloth and um, fill it with, um, stitch it full of bullet ants. And then to become a man, you have to put your arm into this um, ant sleeve and let them bite you and um, all, all evening. <clears throat> And then they have to do it again and again and again, uh, which is just <laughs> horrifying. Uh, usually the, the arm turns black and sometimes they, they have temporary paralysis and it's just excruciatingly painful. And so I'm glad I am not, um, I am not a man in that particular indigenous uh, tribe. And there are many, many more um, ants to talk about. Um, I, I would run out of time before I got to all the cool ones. Uh, but I do want to mention um, a few more uh, brief anecdotes about how they find their way home. So ants are, uh, they send out scouts to find food and foragers to collect the food, and they often w range um, uh, really far away from their home. So how do they find their way back? Well, in one species of ants, they actually uh, will count their steps, and so they kind of have a mental log of how many steps they've taken, and then they just kind of retrace their steps. So they use a combination of a pheromone trail and then um, counting to retrace their steps. And we kind of know this, we know pheromones are important already, but um, some ambitious researchers uh, decided to test the, the counting uh, method. And so they took a bunch of ants and put them into three groups. They had some ants with normal legs, some ants they made little tiny ant stilts, so their eggs were, uh, legs were longer. And then some, they chopped off their legs um, halfway, so their legs were shorter. And what they noticed was that the ones with stilts would always overshoot the return journey, and the ones with stumps would think they were home way before they actually got home. Meaning that if the if the number of steps is how they're counting, uh, or how, how, if counting their steps is how they're finding their way home, if you have longer legs, you're going to travel a further distance and overshoot your target. So 
at least some ant species count their steps as a way to find their way home. Other ants do something completely different that's even more impressive. This is uh, the Tunisian desert ant, and the, the Tunisian desert ant lives in an environment that is um, really too hot to live in. In fact, if they stay still for more than a few seconds, they will burn um, because of the heat from the sand. And so they have incredibly long legs, and they're the, one of the fastest ants on the planet, and they just scurry as fast as they can trying to find food before they fry in the hot sun. So what you see here is their their entrance hole to their nest, and this little scout is kind of wandering randomly around looking for food, and then it finds food. And instead of retracing its pheromone trail and counting its step, it zooms straight home, which is fantastic. This is uh, this is a method of navigation called dead reckoning, and what it what it um, means or it implies that the insect has the location of their home as an abstract mental model in their heads. So um, they know where they are in relation to home and how far away, um, even if they're going in all kinds of different directions and all kinds of different paths. And there's, so we think they maybe rely on some landmarks to orient themselves, uh, but they're able to find their way home from uh, quite a distance away following a new path, which is which is just phenomenal. Um, a lot of humans wouldn't be able to do this, right? If, if I set you if I set you loose in the woods and had you wander for two miles randomly and then had you make a straight line back to where you started, uh, very, very few of us would be able to do this. <clears throat> so, but this Tunisian desert ant can do this. And um, it implies that their, their kind of intelli their, their intelligence is pretty complex, right? To have an abstract, um, mental state is a sign of a pretty complex consciousness. Um, so ants, we shouldn't under, underestimate them. They're, they're different than us for sure, and they're less intelligent for sure, but um, they are incredibly intelligent for the, the role they play in ecosystems and in their own um, social systems.